I envision a world where everyone can have leverage. I also envision a world where people can know that they can become whoever they want at no matter what age they are and that you can build the individual that you want to be and that you've always wanted to be, and it's possible. Welcome to the Living In Podcast, a show that helps successful real estate teams accelerate their growth and impact. Livian, love how you live in all aspects of life. All right, so we're going to kick it off with Brindley Tucker. And Brindley, uh, you wear so many different hats, but for listeners, who are you? Oh, wow, what a loaded question, Eric. First and foremost, thank you so much for having me today. Absolutely. And, um, so grateful to be here. Wow, you know, Brindley Tucker, that is that is a big question. Um, the Brindley Tucker that's here today is definitely not the Brindley Tucker that, you know, was here 10 years ago when I started with the company. Yeah. So I'll celebrate 11 years with KW this year. This is my 10th family reunion, which is just crazy. What's, what's changed in 10 family reunions? Oh my goodness, a lot, a lot. What has changed with me? Or yeah, with, absolutely. Yeah, yeah so, let's get there. You know, so my first family reunion was 2012. I had started with the Keller Williams Market, at Keller Williams Market Center in South Florida in 2011. I had done a lot of really cool things in my life. I had worked on Wall Street. I had was um, an assistant trader and had done a lot of different things. Sold country club memberships for Club Corp, and that was kind of how I got my intro into real estate. And decided that I wanted to become a realtor. And yet everything I had done in life and learned up to that point, I was an assistant first. It was a great kind of apprenticeship to learn how to do something. And so I applied to be a real estate assistant and Nikki Ubaldini, who owns our yeah. South Florida region, um, hired me to be her director of agent services. And so I started with the company as a director of agent services in a market center um, in Palm Harbor, Florida. And at that time I was probably in one of the darkest places of my life. I was back home at 30, you know, 31 and in a relationship that was very toxic and not a, not a great place to be. And, um, went to my team leader, they were doing family reunion in Orlando and it was an hour and a half drive from the market center. And so I went to my team leader at the time and said, Hey, if I pay for half, can I go? And little did I know that would be probably the best investment, that few hundred dollars would be the best investment I ever made in myself. What did you, what did you hear or what did you experience that made it that? I don't want to get emotional. Um, I remember walking into Red Bash yeah. and everyone was so happy. Like they were smiling and they were hugging and, and I didn't even know, like I couldn't even fathom at that moment and at that time what happiness felt like because yeah. I was in such a dark place. And then I remember Gary and Mo getting on stage and all they talked about was God, family, and business and our culture. And that was everything that I was filling this God-sized hole at the time with that was missing. Yeah. It was all missing. And what were you filling that with then? Self-destructive behavior okay. and a lot of alcohol at the time. So then let's, let's put a pin in that and then let's go yeah. to this family reunion. What does the business look like today? So today, it's kind of neat, you know, back then, even working with agents as a director of agent services, I envisioned a world where we could enrich lives to the power of leverage, that we could give agents a place that they could come and they could have any type of leverage they need at any time. So now we're a team of 26. We do everything from recruiting, training, transaction management, listing management, database, anything that you need in your business as a business owner, um, so that you can have more time and focus on the things that Gary tells us are most important. Lead gen, lead follow-up, appointments, negotiating, and scripts. So now then you run a company that supports real estate agents really across all facets of their industry. All their facets business, of right? the industry, yeah. yep. Yeah. So you go from director of agent services yeah. to a company with 26 plus team members. Yes. I think that's such an awesome story too because you know so many people that start in the market centers see that director of agent services or see that director of first impressions role as beneath them sometimes right. or that it's a, a ceiling to their potential. How come you didn't feel that way? Because I had only known, you know, my mother in 1985 started as a secretary for Raymond James. Yeah. 
And when I graduated from high school, she was a senior VP of institutional sales wow. 20 years later. That's awesome. Right? And that put me through college yeah. and her hard work. And I was raised by a single mom. I'm an only child. So watching her go from making $12,000 a year to being able to put me into a four-year private university, that's yeah. all I ever knew. That that That's the best way to learn is to surround yourself with people that know more than you yeah. and that can mentor you to, to, to go to that next level. What did you learn from your mom? Because that's an, that's a ton of resilience, I would I would imagine. But a single mom going from twelve thousand to a senior VP role, what do you learn? My mother always taught me, it's all about perseverance. She taught me the definition of perseverance that things are going to happen in life, right? She was very much in a in you know she was in the stock market during a time when it was a very male dominant yeah. industry, and women were not women were the secretaries, they were the order takers. I'm not sure that it's not still male dominated. Yeah, it at this probably point, is. Right? Yeah, it yeah. probably is. It yeah, probably even is more so then. I'm sure. Right, yeah. and and she just persevered because she had a kid and yeah. she wanted a better life for me and didn't want me to fall into the textbook you know, trouble that a, that a typical, you know, only child, single parent runs I, into. I ask about stories because we were talking before we went on about stories, right? In the, um, that you are in NLP, right? And yeah. your, um, you've gone through a number of different like certifications and trainings with that. Um, what have you learned about the stories that you tell yourself? Yeah, so I always go back to the story wheel. You know, okay. we take, we, we can easily, something can happen. We can have a reaction. And then we immediately go into judgment. And typically that judgment is based on our belief system, right? And we learn in neuro-linguistic programming that from the ages of zero to seven is what we call an imprint age. And that's where the majority of your belief system is actually formed. And then you go into a modeling phase, right? Seven to about 18-ish where you're around your friends and everything you're learning is from your experiences and your friends and your family members, right? And then beyond that is when we start learning about relationships. And when we have any type of trauma or, um, you know, a, a non-traditional household, your belief system is obviously imprinted during those not so great moments. So I have a four-year-old and not that you're going to give me advice, right? But how do I not screw up his imprint then? Right. <laughs> it's funny you say that because I've started doing NLP with kids. Okay. And I recently did a kids course and a dear friend of all of ours asked me after the kids course, what did you learn? And I said that adults are really screwed up. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you know? And uh, I we're think pretty much just kids, right? Yes. But I think what it's, what it is, is it's all pattern, yeah. right? I'm, a, I'm fortunate enough to be coached by Tony Robbins this year. And that's something he talks about is that it's, you've got to break the pattern, right? Because that's all that happens is we pass the patterns down generationally. Yeah. So if you can recognize your patterns and the better you become, then you're going to pass those same belief systems onto your children. Yeah. I think what I hear you say is I have to always get better and be more self-aware of what patterns am I creating or what imprint am I leaving? That's right. Yeah. Because I say, you know, the, the Brindley Tucker that's sitting here with you today is not the Brindley Tucker that walked into that family reunion yeah. 10 years ago. What would you say to that version 10 years ago? Just to keep going. Yeah. And then it's all going to, like, I, I couldn't have imagined the life that I have today. Yeah. And this company is a huge part of that, a huge part of our culture. And, you know, Gary's vision and making his world big enough for yeah. all of us to be able to do what we love. We were talking about that off uh, off camera was how one of the biggest like takeaways for me and something I didn't really expect was how kind Gary is. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that, that was surprising to me. And, and you had the exact same experience. I've never, my interaction with him has been very um, minimal yet every, it's been so impactful. Because yeah. every interaction I've had with him, he has always been helpful. He has always done the right thing. And then he also ends it with a heart emoji. So you can't, <laughs> you can't go wrong with that, right? I got an email the other day. I did not get a heart emoji in my email. <laughs> so I am disappointed. Well, we might need to work on the email <laughs> That's then. Right. That's right. Dang. So uh, coaching with Tony Robbins, right? Yeah. Like personal coaching with him. Yep. Yep. Which is wild. What do you have to do to have Tony Robbins? Spend coach? a lot of money. Okay. <laughs> okay. You know, I think the big thing for me was how do I, you know, Gary's taught us that who you surround yourself with matters. Yeah. You know, the sum of the five people. And I wanted to figure out how I could get into bigger rooms to bring 
tips, tricks, and tactics from mm. other industries and other business leaders into real estate. Okay. Because the, the coaching and the work that I do is with business owners. It's not necessarily with realtors. Yeah. And so in order to help them grow their business, they're going to grow as much as I am as a coach. And so this was a great way for me to go. Like I just spent last weekend with a gentleman who owns a massive manufacturing company in California and learning logistically how yeah. he runs that is pretty impactful. Yeah, we, we've been talking about a lot of Livian is thinking about the deal flow or, or, or pipeline like a logistics company, right? That's it's right. like if your input is, is a defect from the manufacturer or if it's uh, conversion rate into final product yeah. is is not optimal. Everything else down the line is broken or defective. That's right. Um, and yet, most of the time, real estate agents don't take that approach, or business owners yeah. don't take that approach. We look at McDonald's. Yeah. Right. I haven't had McDonald's in twenty years, but McDonald's <laughs> it doesn't have You're the best really burger. You're really missing out. Right. Kidding. They might have the yeah. best fries, but they don't have the True. best burger. Yet, what they have is a system. Yeah. And they have a very simple system that was easy to scale. Right, and so it's about simplifying the system and avoiding technical debt. Yeah, I mean they scale to those without high school educations, oftentimes That's right. without. And I mean, I, I know most of my buddies worked at McDonald's when we were in high school, and That's they right. were able to scale, deliver the same product with high school kids. Absolutely, yeah. I met a gentleman once that owned forty-six McDonald's franchises, wow. and he was a college, he was a high school dropout. But the system was so easy that he was able, with a little bit of seed money, to create an empire based on a system. Total side note, makes me think about this. The house that I live in now bought from a guy who owned a number of McDonald's franchises as well. There were raccoons living in the house and a bunch of birds. So maybe maybe wow. the simple, maybe the system is built so well that you don't actually have to uh, think outside of the, the box or That's the right. color outside the lines. Yeah. That's right, there you go. What What's the application of that for real estate agents? So I think it goes back to the same thing. It's simplifying, right? It's If it's overcomplicated, every time a human has to become involved, a, the system stops. Something's broken. Yeah, yeah, something's broken. And so you have to look at how much human involvement do I have in my processes? And the minute that a human becomes involved, one system stops and the other one begins. So you have to figure out how to completely automate where you take the human out of the process. And one of the areas of friction that, that comes to my mind is on the idea of getting the business with better talent. And that's actually how we met, right? Is we hired your company to um, recruit, um, hire and train uh, operations team. And we love her still. And um, so we're grateful for that. Um, what made you address that market need? Yeah. So I think, again, going back to right the the ability to lead and cultivate talent from an assistant standpoint from the beginning. Yeah. Right. And I saw a need. I saw a hole and a gap because a lot of leadership requires mastery like everything else. Yeah. You, you know, I believe that you can be born with leadership tendencies, but you're not born a leader. You have to. You get it through practice. You get it through 10,000 hours leading you towards mastery. And I saw a massive gap in the talent game. And also yeah. Gary's taught us you, you succeed through others, right? Yet agents didn't necessarily have the time nor the behavioral style to slow down and go through the process. Okay, so that's a great uh, observation then. So is where then do agents get stuck on recruiting? Okay, yep. So. You like horses, I like horses. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Let's get into business together, right? Okay. You have yep. a pulse, you have one yeah. thing on your resume that looks that like higher. you could do it. Yeah. yeah, we all have. I mean, yeah. I'm an entrepreneur also, yeah. right? It's, I mean, I've done this a few times. So I think what it is, is we're able to help hold the agent accountable to the process. Okay. We're not a headhunter. We're not going to, you know, I don't believe in finding the talent for you and then telling you the person that you're gonna hire. Yeah. We leverage the time. And that's okay. really what it's about because time is our most valuable commodity, Eric, yeah. right? You and I have the same 24 hours in a day, the same yeah. as Gary, the same as Warren Buffett, yeah. right? It's how we choose to use it and how we value time. And so that's what my whole point was. If I can master minutes for agents okay. and give them back time, their families will love them again. They'll, they'll have free time. They won't be stressed. We'll yeah. have less, you know, health issues. And I know that's something that's really important to live in. Yeah. So, so all in all, if we can, help them understand and appreciate the commodity of time, then everything else falls into place. My experience in working with, with you and your company was that that level of like external accountability was valuable to one, accelerate the process because the hiring process is lengthy when we do it right. right, right? And, absolutely. And so I have a propensity to drag it out because I can only schedule it when it's convenient mm -hmm. for me, right? And 
having somebody as a third party that says, okay, here's when it's scheduled, the next meeting is scheduled for, layers that accountability. And, um, and I think also having an independent set of eyes mm -hmm. for the agent, the business owner, who's gone through it several times more than any agent right. will have. Um, it, it really goes back to what I think about is like, you know, Gary always talks about the triangle, right? And the triangle, mm -hmm. one of those sides is leverage. leverage that's right. And it's hiring specialists who are experts and have bring unique ability in one arena of expertise. And that's where you guys come from. Right. Human capital is your most important asset in your business. Yeah. It is the most important asset. And what happens is, is that talent wants to be paid for their talents. And so the biggest mistakes I find is we can get stuck a little bit in an old school mentality of I can pay this person $15 an hour yeah. or 40 K and they're going to change my world. And Gary recently said it, find that one person, pay them a ton of money so they yep. never leave and they will change your world. Absolutely. And so it's great to have people that have their pulse on what's happening in the industry. And generationally human capital is changing. It's so interesting because I think agents never think about leveraging out hiring for whatever reason. We, we leverage out, you know, CPAs and physicians and someone to cut our hair and do everything else. But for some reason, we never leverage hiring. And when I had the realization that if that's not what I'm good at and want to be good at or want to even go and learn, I should find someone who enjoys doing that. And that does it all day. Yeah. They can talk to more people. They're strength yeah. in numbers, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that, that people is the most important capital in a business. How much have you changed as a leader and in what ways? Oh my goodness gracious. <laughs> wow. You should ask some of the people that used to work for me. <laughs> you know, I mean, it literally, listen. Would we have to censor the conversation? Probably. <laughs> okay. And, and, and honestly, rightfully so, you know, yeah. I haven't always been the best leader. And, you know, I think here's the other thing too. I think as leaders, leadership is influence, right? And as leaders, we have a responsibility, not only to the people that we lead, but we have a responsibility to the leaders that we grow and that we cultivate and we build. And I, I fortunately have had some really great leaders in my life yeah. and I've had some not so great leaders in my life. Which one did you learn more from? The not so great. Yeah, me, I agree. Right? Yeah. And, and what happens is that leadership flows downhill. Yeah. So if you've got not great leaders at the top, it's going to permeate through you and your organization. And I'm so grateful that I learned that early on in my career mm -hmm. so that I could recognize it. That if yeah. how I'm showing up with a leader doesn't just influence our organization, but it influences the entire organization because as you grow and scale, now I have a leadership team. So yeah. there's people in our organization that I only talk to once a quarter and on team meetings. So how I lead our leadership is imperative because now I have a ripple effect, right? Tactically, how different is that today than it was, say, 36 months ago? So different. So different. I think I'm a more responsive leader than a reactive leader. Okay. Right? I think that my the number one skill that I believe that I've mastered, start have, have been mastering, still in the process, yeah. is emotional intelligence. Okay. I think emotional intelligence as a leader is the one thing that I see prevents people from success in leadership. When you say emotional intelligence, is that how you show up or how you interpret how others Both. show up okay Both. it's how you show up as a leader and how you manage your emotions in a situation I, I work very hard today to always assume positive intent and it wasn't always like that and today I really work to always come from curiosity because most people at the end of the day don't have malicious intent yeah. They yeah. really are doing the best that they have with what they have. And that is really why I started to master NLP. Number one, to change my own belief system because I didn't like the human that I was, yeah. but also to influence the humans around me to find out why do they think the way they think? Yeah. Why do they make the decisions that they make? Because that's all based on their belief system. Is there an element of trust that has to change in that equation as well? Where do you trust your people differently today than you did previously because of something internally or some sort of story that you tell yourself? I think trust today in our company has been built based on expectations. Okay. We are much more clear around our expectations during the hiring process. Yeah. We talk about the fact that we are a highly accountable organization and that you are going to be held to the fire. And if that's not okay, that's okay. This just might not be the, the, what is, the world for you. What does that look like when, when it's held to the fire? Like, what might that sound like? So we have strong KPIs, strong metrics, okay. strong goals, and we have a very highly um, close knit organization where we call each other out. Yeah. And we call each other out, not just on your job performance, but like, hey, did you run this morning? 
hey, why are you? Eat, why do I see that Kit Kat bar yeah. in the Zoom screen, right? When you committed to losing 100 pounds this year, you yeah. Know? We we really say like we want you to have a better life, yeah. And that's why we're doing this. And we have a lot of women in our organization. So my entire leadership team is is female. I never would have thought, Eric, that I would work with all women. And what a joy, yeah. Because now we get to impact families. We just yesterday. And this is an emotional moment. Our company got an email to set up their health benefits. Oh, that's awesome. And what a cool, awesome yeah. opportunity that we get to offer medical benefits to our team now. Yeah. I mean, it's a, such a good life benefit for everyone in the organization <laughs> and a great retention opportunity for the company as well that people don't have to leave now because of uh, life circumstances. You mentioned health is a, is a key um, component of the business. Uh, what's changed health wise for you? I feel like a lot. Wow. You know, that was a really big thing and I'll get real honest about this. So I woke up pre COVID probably like probably six months prior to COVID and I had fake extensions in my hair, fake eyelashes. I, and I looked in the mirror that morning and I just cried and I was like, who is this person? I was 50 pounds overweight. Um, I didn't like the way I felt in the mornings and I just, I didn't, it was like that all those feelings from the past coming back, but just in a different way, yeah. right? And then COVID hit, and nothing like having to be with yourself yeah. 24-7 yeah. to start making some final changes. Yeah. And um, so I decided that I was gonna use the opportunity to focus on health. Okay. So I hired a nutritionist. You know, I currently have two coaches, and, um, and I'm a platinum partner for Tony, so yeah. I believe in a village. I think it takes a village for to speed track and mm -hmm. rocket launch your growth. And so I hired a nutritionist and then Is that Susie? That's I Susie, think, yeah. Susie Dubois. Yeah. And we started learning about gut health yeah. and food and what it does to your body and inflammation and whole body health. And then I would wake up and I would just start walking. Okay. And if you knew me then, Eric, yeah. I would always say if you see me running, you should probably run. Because I'm running to something or away from it. So yeah. you want to run too. Me too. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. And I was like, I'm gonna become a runner. Like who the hell wakes up and says, I want to become a runner? Like um, that sounds- When you live with Jaleen Snell, who's okay. like living with a Navy SEAL, okay. that's what you okay. do. Yep. Gotcha. Yep. For those of you who don't know J Jaleen, yeah. look her up. She's She has a great fitness podcast with yeah. Chad Himes. And yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's legit when you live with someone like that. When you surround yourself with those people. And right? that's what I did. Yeah. I started surrounding myself with my friends that were health gurus okay. because they knew more about it than I did. Yeah. And so I would run from one stop sign to the next. Mm -hmm. And then the next day I'd run two stop signs and the next day I'd run three and then I ran around the block and the next thing I knew I was running a 5k. I feel like you were posting it on social media like almost as an accountability mechanism. I was. Yeah. I was. And to inspire others that you, if you can just make a 1% improvement every day, yeah. you'll wake up one day. A runner. And you'll be a runner. Now I'm not going to say I love running. Yeah. So what I do now is I said, I know I need to run, but I do, I do spin mostly in group health now. But when I'm in other cities, I love to run. Yeah. And I just got to run over the Ben Franklin Bridge in Philadelphia recently. That's cool. Right? Yeah. So you have to make it fun. And when you, so you've changed then tons from a health standpoint. Um, and I'm assuming that's had a carryover impact on what else? I mean, everything. You know, I think th there's the four pillars, right? There's first you have to get your spirit right. I truly believe that. And yeah. that happened. In, in the beginning, right? Okay. When I got sober, it happened that I, I had to finally give up the reins and say, I'm not God. I don't play yeah. one on TV. And How long have you been sober for? I'll celebrate 10 years in That's May. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Yep. And um, I had to I had to say, like, I can't be the God of my world anymore. And whether, you know, I say God, but whatever yeah. you choose, universe, higher power, and then you're able to get your mental set, right? And so then I started working on, okay, I can't control my first thought, but I can control my second. And how do I get my second thought to tell my first thought? We don't think like that anymore, right? So then once I had spiritual and mental, then I could work on the emotional. And then the emotional help came by studying emotional intelligence, reading emotional 2.0, surrounding myself with friends that mastered their emotions, yeah. right? And then having those three pillars set allowed me to then tackle the physical health, which is the hardest, I believe. And, and I'm assuming that's had spillover impact on your business growth. My business growth, the people around me, how I show up yeah. as a leader, how congruent I feel, yeah. right? What's the, what's the um, most important or pivotal thing you've learned from Tony? Is the triad. Okay, now I need to know about the triad. Yeah, so the triad is um, 
phys- physiology, so okay. the way that you stand. So you know when you feel excited and happy, yeah. like you have a different stature than when you're depressed or sad, right? And then um, focus. So what are you focusing on? You know, and we've learned in bold what you focus on expands. Yeah. So if you cho- there's good and bad in everything. And if you choose to see the bad, guess what you're gonna always see? Yeah. The bad. If you want to see the good, what are you always gonna see? The good. Right. And then the labels and the meanings that we give things. Okay. And I think that's been the big one is that, you know, I had someone recently come up to me and say, I think you're a really angry person. Wow. And I was like, okay, maybe three years ago you could have said that to me and I would have been like, yeah, you're totally right. But today, not so much. And I said, what makes you think that? Can you share your experience? Well, I can't think, I can't think of anything right now. I can't think of anything right now. And I said, okay, well come back whenever you do. She goes, well, you just, you just seem angry. And I said, well, can I share an observation with you? And she said, yes. And I said, if you view me as angry, then you're always holding space for me to show up as angry. Yeah. Because you've labeled me in such a way that I'm this way. I'm always going to appear that way to you. I could do anything. I could be the nicest person you've ever met, but you're going to see something that's going to trigger you to think I'm angry. So you have to change the meaning. What makes that person hold on to that, you think? It's, you know, it's, again, it goes back to our own belief systems. Okay. The one thing that we can control is us. Yeah. And our internal representation and our model of the world is based on our belief system. So how we want to view things or labels that we put on people, that's how they're going to show up to us, right? Yeah. So if you want to change the way you feel and the way you see things, then change the way you look at it. Change the label. Change the meaning you give it. Yeah. When you think about, as we wrap up, what what's next for Brindley Tucker and your companies? You know, I love that question, and I've decided... I envision a world where everyone can have leverage. I also envision a world where people can know that they can become whoever they want at no matter what age they are. And that you can build the individual that you want to be and that you've always wanted to be. And it's possible. You don't have to be limited. What gets you more excited or motivated? The idea of that mindset, right? That, That really teaching, training, coaching others on that belief system or business building? I think both of them because okay. I think in order to build business at a high level, you have to break through the ceilings that are holding you back, the limiting beliefs, the imposter syndrome, all of the things that hold you back from going to the next level. So I think you can't have one without the other, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, I've of course loved our conversation like always, so oh, thanks so Eric, much for sitting down with me. Thank you so much for having yeah, me. Yeah. I'm so honored. Yeah. So grateful.